Donald, born and raised in Edinburgh, coming back to the Usher Hall must be quite a special thing for any musician who was born here, but uh, it must be loads of musical memories. Um, when and how did you first start coming to concerts here? I started coming to concerts basically on the coattails, uh, so to speak, of musicians in the audience in that I sold programs here. Uh, I, on, on Friday nights I sold the, the programs for the, Sco the then Scottish National Orchestra and during the festival I, I was on most nights so I, some of my formative musical experiences were on a very hard seat in the Usher Hall, the steps, <laughs> because there wasn't a seat to be had. Uh, and back then, this was in 1970, 71, perhaps even earlier, uh, I, without knowing actually where my professional life was going to take me, I, I was hearing Giulini, Carlo Maria Giulini, I was hearing Leonard Bernstein, I was seeing one of Carl Burns last concerts and I mean that clearly made an indelible impression on me and now coming back uh, where I myself am uh, now standing up there and presuming there are program sellers out there too, it's, it's sort of come full circle. You didn't just sell programmes when you were here, you, you, were, you performed on this stage too at an early age as a part of the Edinburgh Festival Chorus. What did you sing and who with? It was 1965 and uh, it was the formation of the Edinburgh Festival Chorus and the inaugural concert of the Edinburgh Festival Chorus was uh, Mahler's Eighth Symphony. And I was, what was I, I was 10, and uh, I was enlisted into the boys' choir under the uh, utterly compelling, utterly authoritarian uh, tutelage of Arthur Oldham. And I sang in that first concert. I remember there's actually a picture uh, which members of the festival chorus have subsequently shown me uh, where I was standing right behind the horn section. Uh, and my goodness, and that was 1965. And uh, interestingly enough, I took up the French horn I was, when I was at university. Oh. Well, that must have made a, a huge impression upon you, knowing your passion for Mahler and, and Strauss. And, and coming back here, playing Strauss this evening, mm -hmm. you're back here in, uh, in October with the BBC SSO um, playing some more Mahler. Mm -hmm. What is it about that Central European music that grabs you? And do those gargantuan forces ever face you slightly? I would say that my long experience in opera uh, makes those large canvases, those large symphonies of Gustav Mahler or the twin poems of Richard Strauss less daunting. Uh, when you're conducting a, an opera of Richard Wagner or of Richard Strauss, you, you, you have many, many strands there too. I, I find the music quite remarkable. I find the, the, the narrative, all of these pieces on some level are deeply autobiographical. And the life of Gustav Mahler was, was utterly fascinating and in many ways his symphonies, uh, they chronicle not only what he experienced as a both conductor and composer, but they chronicled also events leading up to the cataclysm that was the First World War, where the wor world was never the same again. And the flip side of that coin was Richard Strauss, whose music is also autobiographical in that he was a a happy camper, as we would say, uh, a man who was uh, happily married. He didn't really question anything about life. And that exuberance and optimism is, is reflected in, in so much of his music. And even in, even in the Don Quixote, uh, where, of course, it's, it's all about the, the, the dastardly deeds and the, the adventures wow. of, of this knight. But so much of the music is just is generally happy. It's, as I say, it's exuberant and uh, and yet again, there, towards the end of the piece, where, the, where you might say it ends sadly, all of a sudden Strauss decides, well, I'm not sure I wish, wish the mm. audience to leave here feeling too sad <laughs> and too, um, too morbid. Yeah. So all of a sudden there's this beautiful little play out, which is along the lines of, oh, don't take it all so seriously. Yeah. It was only a story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coming back to, to this hall, just again for a minute, that um, you've conducted here, you performed here when you're knee height of grasshopper, you've been on the stage with, with many orchestras, including the BBC Scottish Symphony. And I know that this orchestra have 
love playing in this acoustic and that audiences here um, from all over the world who come to Edinburgh during the festival and other times of the year find this hall, of all the halls in Scotland, find that this, this place has an atmosphere to it, it has, it has an energy. Do you pick up on that and does it, do you find it that this, could this acoustic be slightly daunting? This acoustic is one of the finest in the world. It's one of, the, I would say, in the top five of acoustics around the world. That is corroborated by uh, many of the great orchestras who, when it comes to touring, are eager to come to Edinburgh mm -hmm. because Edinburgh is synonymous with the Usher Hall. It's also mm -hmm. synonymous with whiskey, but it's synonymous with the Usher Hall. It's a remarkable acoustic. Uh, I, I do a lot of work in Vienna. I do a lot of, a lot of work in Berlin. I do a lot, a lot of work in the States and uh, when I speak to orchestral members there, so many of them, when they know I'm from Edinburgh and they know that I'm now working with the BBC Scottish, speak fondly of concerts in the Usher Hall. It, it's a remarkable place, it's, uh, it's large but it's not too large. Mm. It can carry the biggest, the most um, dynamic of orchestral scores, at the same time it carries the, the quietest, it, uh, a leader mm -hmm. uh, a recital in here sounds fantastic and any or it's an instrument, I mean a good acoustic is like an instrument which an orchestra plays or which a singer exploits. Do you have a standout, one standout musical highlight from all those performances either as a performer or as a member of the audience that you've heard and seen in this, in this building? Oh goodness. There are so many experiences here. I, I would say, though, the, an experience that made not only a huge impression on me, but really made me more determined than ever to follow this course of going to Germany and studying and working and conducting, it was the two performances that uh, Leonard Bernstein gave in 1972 of Gustav Mahler's Second Symphony. Uh, that was once again with the Edinburgh Festival Chorus. I, I was not a, taking part in it. With the London Symphony Orchestra, uh, they went subsequently to Ely Cathedral and recorded it. I will never forget the impact of the work. I will never forget the impact of the visceral uh, approach that Bernstein took, leaping up into the air, the ecstasy this, this rapt concentration you felt in the hall. Uh, it, when, when, at the end of the work, the audience could only scream because there was this build-up intention in the house. And a lot of it not only had to do with these phenomenal performers, but also uh, Bernstein was this conduit. He, it was, in that moment he was Gustav Mahler. In that moment he was composing this work. He wasn't just recreating it. I was completely gobsmacked and I, I was there for the second evening and I knew there and then that whatever it takes, however long it takes, this music has to, I want to spend my life in and around this music, in and around this sound world, in and around the culture that gave us such masterpieces mm -hmm. and this all happened here at the Usher Hall, Edinburgh.